the weekly show with David J. Maloney. This week, David chats with the author of Surprised by Oxford, Carolyn Weber. And now, here's your host, David J. Maloney. Welcome, everyone, to the weekly show. I'm your host, David J. Maloney. On tonight's show, we've got author Carolyn Weber joining us once again. The feature film adaptation of her memoir, Surprised by Oxford, releases in the theaters later this month, and it details her incredible true story of self-discovery, faith, friendship, and love, all before the historic and beautiful background of Oxford. We've got Dr. Carolyn Weber back with us again after the break, so don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. When you first read Surprised by Joy, um, what was your initial feeling about it the film portrays it of course but i'd kind of like to get more insight from you directly hmm. i think the first time i was amazed that he got lost walking out of oxford as well <laughs> but when i arrived at the train station i did the exact same thing as himself i went the wrong direction which i think is such a great metaphor for all of us <laughs> Right. As Chesterton says, you know, there's only two ways to get home and one is to stay put and the other one is to walk around the world until you come back. And um, and I I really resonated with that. But I also loved his push and pull, his authenticity of this sort of inconvenient attraction to the truth and how it withstood his questions and that our God wasn't a fragile God. And yet also the. um the pride that we have in fighting God's pursuit of us and um, <clears throat> and the ways that I think he, there should be a mirror on the cover of all of Lewis's books, you know, because there's this way in which it makes you really look at yourself and you think, Oh yeah. Okay. How am I doing that too? So it was surprised by joy. I think I was really moved by also that notion of joy and how all joy reminds it, it helped me finally put a finger on something that you can't quite put a finger on that infinite longing I talked about with romantic writers, but that there's some, there's a thrill, there's a recognition, there's something we feel at times that reminds us that we were built for something bigger and, uh, and that there is a design and meaning and purpose. And that's not an accident. And even though it might be fleeting or, or it might seem transient, it actually points us to something that's not. Did, uh, was it Kent who suggested the book to you? Uh, yes. Um, and he had actually first suggested to me A Severe Mercy by Sheldon Van Auken, who had been an American who was a student of Lewis's, he and his wife. And it's a beautiful, powerful book. And that was a sucker punch. Um, it was quite a strategic recommendation from him. I had no idea. Um, <laughs> that's funny. Um, what was the next Lewis book that you picked up and how far apart was it from your reading Surprised by George? Oh gosh, that's a great question. Um, you know, I don't know. I mean, I, I know I went back and read the Narnia Chronicles very differently. <laughs> I was like, oh, because I was interested in children's literature too. But um, so many of them, I ended up just reading so many of them, but I, I think it might've been The Great Divorce was definitely right up there where I read it because it was quick and and it kind of reads a little bit like, um, you know, A Christmas Carol, the same sort of sense. But it really it really challenged me to think about um, the hells that we create for ourselves and, and how we trap ourselves in that. And I remember being very challenged and moved by that as uh, that one was another one that spoke to me quite early on on the heels of that work. I, I can only imagine considering the fact that it was Oxford that much of the literary, theological, and philosophical jargon concepts and otherwise had to be more, made more accessible for the film version of the story. Uh, I'm curious if I can kind of peer behind the curtain for just a moment, though. Were there any concepts that had a big impact on your journey that were not really able to be fleshed out in either your book or the film version of the story? Oh, gosh, that's a great question. I, I mean, I think in the one scene where there's the professor lecturing about the notion of relativity, you know, the relativity of truth and that sort of <clears throat> deconstructionism and everything that was happening in postmodernism, early postmodernism. Um, I remember sort of being as a student of literature and of um, critical theory, leaning towards sort of a postmodernist notion of truth and 
that was being really challenged that what happens if we just do unravel everything, if everything is just a system of signs that's deferred, is there ever such a thing we can know as truth in the, in the subjectivity of truth? Um, and thinking that again, truth and subjectivity couldn't be reconciled, just like free will, you know, predestination can't be reconciled, but it's not about reconciliation, right? It's about paradox that two can sit in the, in the same palm at the same time. It's not a contradiction. It's just an apparent one. There's a line in the film, and I, I'm probably going to botch it here, that states something to the effect of maybe we reach for something because that something is really there. Uh, and that, obviously, it's a rough paraphrase, well quoted. but, ho but well hopefully quoted. close enough. <laughs> Very um, good. <laughs> there's a lot packed into that sentiment. Where did that line come from? And if it wasn't from you, what did you think when you heard or read it? Mm. Well, it it's Ryan's phrasing and Ryan is a beautiful writer and he does have this way. Of, I, I think he did a, a beautiful job of distilling much in the book because it's a long book. I'm yeah. a wordy person. That's my line of work, but, um, <clears throat> but it does resonate with me because I, I did really think uh, that's, that's a whole notion of longing. Why are we longing? Why do we have these desires? Why are we seeking to be fulfilled in so many places, David, that end up being empty. And I remember when I first read the Bible, I was so shocked at how much sense it made. Um, it, that also was just highly inconvenient because I read it actually at first thinking I would attack my Christian friends with it <laughs> and, and show the holes and, you know, poke, poke holes yep, in there. I'm going to outsmart all of you. Well, it's about all of you and I'll go back and I'll read the text. I'll read the book. I know the book. And I read Genesis and I thought, oh, shoot, holy doodle. <laughs> the post-lapsarian theory makes sense. You know, we are fallen and this actually makes a lot of sense um, and how it played out to Revelation. But when you read something like Ecclesiastes, you know, that is not just a midlife crisis book. I mean, that is just, that bears reading. I've never heard it phrased in that way. It is. <laughs> it's a midlife you think crisis. It is? I mean, you know, the guy's got the red sports car and, you yeah. know, hey, 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 don't knock us now. <laughs> <laughs> hey, there's nothing wrong with the red sports car. You know, Lewis yeah. became a believer on the sidecar of a motorcycle. So there you go. There you go. But um, I, I think that for all of us, right? Like we, we look for God in all these places. We don't even know we're looking for him. We're just looking for this fulfillment. And all of, the, all of those things point to him, but it's not it's not where we're fully meant to, to find ourselves. And so I think, um, I think that that was, that was really powerful for me was looking at, um, where do those longings, why are we doing all these things? What, what are we actually living our life for? And something like, it's so easy to dismiss a catechism answer, but something like, you know, to, to love God and enjoy him forever makes a lot of sense actually. You you alluded earlier to, I guess, your uh, approval of the casting of Rose Reed as yourself in the film. And I felt Rory O'Connor was fantastic throughout as Kent. Um, I presume you agree with that casting. Oh, yes. And I didn't get to meet Rory till, till later, till we, we showed up in, in, um, in England. And he was really a delightful person. He and my husband talked much longer, which maybe was more appropriate in the sense that they were, he was playing him, but um, he brought, a, a, I think a very genuine winsomeness to the character, which was hard to convey uh, that there is something, I, I think that was also what spoke to me about, about Kent was this genuine winsomeness, this, um, and that's not, you know, having, um, Guarding one's heart doesn't mean that you're innocent and stupid and naive. It actually takes a lot of wisdom to guard one's heart. And uh, and I think that Rory was able to convey um, a winsomeness that wasn't a pushoverness either. And a, and a, and a level of persistence. <laughs> the book is a, is a little different in the sense that... Um, yeah, I was I was in another relationship and had to, and ended that when I became a Christian, and um, and then had a friendship with him. But he was quite uh, persistent. Ken himself was quite persistent in in well, just being a friend, sharing the truth as well. We were not as romantically involved until later. Got it. Um, how important is it to your faith journey that uh, I'm going to try and quote this appropriately: "All will be all right in the end," as Phyllis Logan delivers so delicately in the film. Oh, yes, that's a good way to put it, too. Um, 
that it's not a trite answer. I mean, I think it can seem really canned and trite, especially to someone in great suffering or pain to say, oh, everything is going to work out for a reason and, and don't worry, everything will be okay. But a happy ending does make up for a lot. <laughs> and when we know that that's where it's going, regardless of how much we mess up or how much others mess up, um, there is comfort and peace in that in the long game. And, uh, and that there is a, a purpose, um, a telos, uh, that's more than just a goal. It's, it's, a, it's a purpose, it's a, something for which we've been designed. I think that does change everything. Obviously, Provost Regina Knight is a character of massive importance in the story. And having seen it now, I can't imagine anybody doing a more sincere and stellar job than Phil's Logan. Is her character mm. also based on a real person or is that another consolidation? Mm. She did a beautiful job. She really conveyed yeah. it. And it was a bit of a composite in that, you know, when I wrote this years ago, you know, my all, all I was uh, at Oriel College, which had only just started admitting women like a few years before I arrived. So my provosts were men um, who spoke very much to me. Um, I had actually some very amazing Christian provost figures, um, the candle figures and that. Um, but she's a bit of a composite of another of another female professor that was very, very influential for me. And they decided to just sort of update the provost so that it'd be a female figure to kind of make, help, help make things maybe a little bit more modern. It was the same as the texting as opposed to emailing. This yeah. is how old I am. I'm very old, Dave. Kent and I are very old, David, in the sense of we were learning email at the time, you know, so they updated some of those things. But yes, very much conveying, as I said before, um, Christian's even in these professorial roles, um, decanal roles, whatnot, that were uh, that were highly educated, very intelligent people who lived real lives and shared their faith and were hospitable and generous and gracious and uh, and open to conversation and did things like paid attention to you, paid attention, saw their students, and in that little way that we're seen in those ways is a is a reminder of how we're seen in bigger ways. How important is it? Uh, in in your mind and in the grand scheme of your story, the realization that it wasn't only effort that made you what you were and what you are. I can't remember who said the line in the film, but it was so embellic to me of the story and the script as a whole. Mm. Well, I think it was a turning point for me that when I really had to sit and face what grace is, you know, that it's not karma and and thank God it's not. <laughs> Else we'd all have coming back at us the tsunamis we deserve, and um, and that we can work so hard, and and never really hit the mark, and and what what actually is the etymology of the word sin? You know, the, the a marksmanship, and and that and in in that there's a gravity at first with grace. It's it's a very difficult, even an off putting, really awful thing to have to face, you know, this sort of shortcomingness and that we could never measure up. But on the other hand, there's a great relief and beauty in the fact that I can rest in that. And that sounds, that can sound like such a difficult leap, but it, it really frees you. It's the same as though you can't, you can't do it for anyone else too. It has to be just yourself. You know, we don't stand, you know, we don't stand before our Lord and, and say, you know, what about the other guy? <laughs> Right. That's one of the first things we see in Genesis. Yeah. It explains everything, right? You know, so it's about our own hearts before God. And uh, we have to answer for our own hearts and and live from there. And so grace, the concept of grace just blew every category I had uh, in which I was going to be self-sufficient and controlling and able to make everything work. And we, that doesn't work. Would you say you felt your way into your faith or was it more an intellectual journey, a combination of both? I know it's not the same for everybody. Well, I think it's a combination of both and then a tertium eloquent, right? As Colet says, there's a third thing. Uh, there's a Holy Ghost thing. And so, yes, it, it, it was thinking for me. For some people, it's not. Thinking for me was really important. That was a form of a way, I think, um, another love language for between God and I, but also that I think our thoughts are proof of grace themselves, David, that, you know, there's not a bubble over our heads, like a cartoon where I can see what you're thinking and vice versa. That's incredible proof of grace, <laughs> but, <clears throat> but that was important for me. And so was feeling to some degree as well. Um, and how we toss that word around in lieu of thinking, but I love the metaphysical poets, you know, John Dunn and whatnot, as I refer to in the movie, the idea that you can think a feeling and feel a thought, you know, not to separate those so much and that there's something, a third thing, a mystery 
something that we can't discern fully, nor are we able to, nor should we, right? I don't want a God I can put in a box, but I also, um, there is a mystery to things and that's not a cop-out answer. Uh, one thing I think the film captures well is the intersection of beauty with questions of truth. And we touched upon it a little bit earlier. What relationship do you see between beauty and questions of, and, of truth or or beauty and intellect or intellect and truth for that matter? Mm, such a beautiful question. It really is. And I mean, there's a whole... Yeah, you can talk about it for hours. So, that, right? so give, give me your two minute first. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> I think for myself... It's that the truth makes things beautiful. It, it's, it's when I used to think before I was a believer, you know, those old canned phrases of, oh, the truth will set you free. Oh my goodness, what an eye roll, right? <laughs> um, but it does. Um, and those roots lie too deep for frost, right? As Tolkien says. And uh, when you are in relationship in truth with someone out of, out of love, out of fellowship, um, it's incredibly beautiful. It really has very little to do um, with how we judge things in our world physically or whatnot. Um, that that truth and, and the truth of God's love for us and the truth in the gospel and living in that truth makes everything beautiful, makes things beautiful. Um, when you were at Oxford and even throughout the rest of your educational teaching and administrative careers in high academia, uh, I, I we talked about how you found yourself, you know, around people of faith that kind of surprised you. But uh, of course, you have to be surrounded also by, you know, I need proof to believe people uh, as you were one of them. Um, but, and if, you know, in being surrounded by them at times, how did you go or how did you not go about things with them? I, I think that um, all conversations, all ideas, all all things, I, in many ways, sometimes actually the greatest doubts expressed push me more towards the faith um, in, in the sense of uh, there's no fear in them. You know, I, I, I think, it, and I think we tried to portray that in the film, you know, many ways when people are having um, one night stands or, you know, drinking and super drunk. And it's not a heavy handed judgment issue. It's just, what are you looking for? And, and I think in many ways, actually, sometimes what atheists or agnostics were saying to me, I think about some of my atheist friends who, who genuinely would care, speak to me and care. Um, I thought what I, I want something better. I want something more. I, I, or, or sometimes, you know, we're so reluctant to trade the best when we have what we think is good. Um, and being, um, comfortable can actually make us even, um, more, uh, disinterested. I mean, you get to a place where there's nothing, all those, all those other conversations help. They, they, if anything, remind us that we're in this journey all together. I, and where I was kind of going with that, I think, was along the lines, of, and maybe a better question would have been, you know, what do you say or, or don't say to non-believers or perhaps those who are faith curious, um, mm -hmm. whom have difficulty reconciling faith with a need for proof or science, or do they just simply have to find it as part of their own journey? Mm, no, it's great. And I entirely understand that. I've been there too. And yeah. And there's moments of consolation and desolation. What I find really fascinating about science is it really isn't at odds. Um, the discoveries and, and things like that are happening. I, I, I don't actually, less and less, I, I don't see how science is at odds with faith. And I, I used to really compartmentalize those and think that, you know, science absolutely discredited it. But of course, there's an expanding universe. <laughs> I mean, that's not at odds at all with our, our, the Judeo-Christian concept of God, right? Like there's, um, the ways our bodies work, the everything, um, that we're fearfully and wonderfully made. None of these things are at odds. Um, if they are look into them, ask questions, um, see for yourself if they decrease or increase your wonder. There's also this intersection of two romances, a divine and an earthly. Um, mm -hmm. What do you make of the intersection of, of those two things in your story? Hmm. 
Um, you ask great questions, Dave. <laughs> well, part, part of it's me, part of it's my assistant producer too. <laughs> I have to give Kyle some credit. Well, Kyle, I'll turn this one on you one day. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I think I know for me. By the way, we have about three or four Kyle questions coming up. So, <laughs> so I can't race, wait to Kyle for a <laughs> um, I, I think, yeah, I, I think that romance, for instance, um, the whole idea of, of being in love with somebody or, or pursuing somebody or being attracted to somebody opens up such vulnerabilities for us, right? And it really is, though, a template for our, our relationship with God. Um, but that relationship, I used to be really freaked out by the notion of people calling the church and his bride. And yeah, I thought all those things were super creepy. And then when I became a believer, I realized how how that marriage metaphor was so important because once you're a Christian, you are married in a sense, regardless if you're single or married, you're married to Christ. Like in the sense that you're taking all your decisions and thoughts and that to that relationship and living your life very differently. And I, I think it's just so important to have that relationship first and foremost. And, uh, and so instead of looking for somebody else to fill that, that place, uh, and so with the earthly connected for me was, I was hesitant. I wasn't going to trust in an earthly father. Um, so I wasn't going to trust in an eternal one. Um, that was a big issue for me. Um, but when I began to pull the threads apart and see that, you know, it's, a, it's a shame to throw the baby out with the baptism water, right. You know, just because I have issues with Christianity or Christians or fathers or whatever, in this way, am I actually going to throw the whole kit caboodle out? And, uh, that doesn't make any sense either. What? What is it that um, is true? We're uh, living in a new age now. Uh, some call it a post-truth world or metamodernism or whatever it is that comes after post-modernism in our cultural history. <laughs> um, what do you think your story has to say to our cultural moment in time? And that is a Kyle question. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, Kyle. <Yeah>. Well, <laughs> everything's a post right? Everything's a post, post everything, post everything. Yeah. Basically been post lapsarian. <laughs> so, um, I think, um, I hope that it would, it would just speak really privately to people that they experience the beauty and the transcendence of seeing Oxford and England and the cinematography that's lovely in a theater, right, David, but that they also would have those bigger questions settle on themselves, um, that when they leave the theater, they can sit between themselves and their soul to be able to ask those kind of questions. I think in our society, we're so distracted, so busy, so tinging and binging and pinging and whatnot, right? It's, you know, like an opening scene of Monty Python. Um, what are we actually giving birth to, you know? And there's, um, it, it's not that we always have to be walking around serious as monks, but have we done the, have, are we doing the good work? Are we doing this good work in ourselves? Um, what are we really living for and how are we living and what, and what will come out of that um, for ourselves and for other people? And I would hope that it would just be able to give people the ability to have that kind of conversation with themselves um, as well as with their friends or anyone else they want to talk about the movie with. Caro, thank you so much for, for joining us. I mean, it's been an, an absolute pleasure. Thank you, David. Absolutely for me too. It's a, It's been joyful in every way and a foretaste of heaven. <laughs> oh, I appreciate that. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Carolyn Weber. Thank you. That's our show for tonight. Thank you so much for watching and a special thanks to Dr. Carolyn Weber for joining us once again. Stay safe, everyone. Mm -hmm.